Thank you very much. So again, hi everyone. Good morning, evening, afternoon, um, wherever you may be due to the wonders of modern technology. Um, and welcome to this final lecture of the lecture series where I'll be presenting to you the first two experiments, more or less, of, of my PhD project. Uh, well, as you may have noticed, I'll be talking about rhythmic priming of syntax processing. So the, the word bilingualism or multilingualism is not in the title, but I'll try to give some relevant information to the lecture series. We have some relevant data, so don't, don't worry. I will, not, I will not try to just bore you to death. There will be content. Okay, so to start with, I would like to give you a small overview of what our project aims to do and what these two experiments that I will be presenting to you aim to do. Uh, we work under uh, a hypothesis that suggests that there may be a shared cognitive system, uh, well, a general cognitive system responsible for, for coding abstract hierarchical structure in language and in the non-linguist and in non-linguistic domains. One of these non-linguistic domains, as you will see, could be musical rhythm, but let's keep going. Uh, if we assume that there is hierarchical structure in language and, and musical rhythm, I will provide examples later on as we go, this hypothesis generates a few research questions. One is whether rhythmic stimulation can influence structural processing in language, whether stimulation by a hierarchical structure in rhythm can influence hierarchical processing in language. This would be some sort of a temporary short-term effect of a rhythm that uh, a participant is exposed to. Our questions two and three uh, look for more long-term relationships. The questions here would be whether there's a relationship between non-linguistic and linguistic and non-linguistic structural processing and whether multilingualism taken as some sort of an index of exposure to different linguistic hierarchical structures can what well, shows a relationship with structural processing in language and in the non-linguistic domains. Uh, if anything, by the way, I, I know that we usually do questions at the end, but if anything's unclear, fishy, or just sounds plain wrong, please feel free to give a sign and I'll um, try my best to explain. Um, okay, so what is this rhythm thing and why should we even care about it? Uh, well, rhythm, very generally can, well, the definition of rhythm is a bit varied in the literature to, to say the least, but very generally we will treat rhythm as the temporal distribution of events. These are usually acoustic events, they can also be visual, well, any other kind of events, visual events, but here we will really focus on acoustic events. And the beauty of rhythm is that the, the moment you have some sort of semblance of re regularity in the uh, acoustic signal, it will allow you to extract higher levels of, of structure, to, to, to try to build structure in your brain. Your, our brains are sort of programmed to try to e extract patterns from whatever they are exposed to. Uh, so if you have some sort of regularity, say you listen to music, which usually features a relatively regular rhythm, you will often find yourself extracting what's called a beat which is in, in very plain terms, an underlying pulsation that sounds roughly like one, 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 that you can also tap to, you can also entrain to, which is already one higher level mental construct than, than the actual temporal distribution of things, uh, as it, it, it is either present or not present in the acoustic stimulus, but you, you still extract this frequency. Uh, but I mean, this is just one level higher and it may not be particularly impressive, but what you will notice is, is when you dance or when you listen to music, you don't usually do one, 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 right? You do something like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, meaning you extract, uh, you build a metrical grid, a metrical structure in your head uh, in which, again, smaller temporal units combine into larger temporal groupings, which combine into temporal constituents. Uh, so how is this relevant to language? Well, I'm not going to go into debates here, but we, I think most of us agree that in language, both prosody and syntax contain a hierarchical structure. In prosody, you have uh, you have uh, syllables which, com which combine into feet, which combine into phonological words, and so on and so forth. 
in syntax, words can combine the phrases, which can combine the larger phrases, which can combine the clauses, which can combine the sentences, and so on and so forth. Obviously, uh, the, the specificity of hierarchical structures in pros of, of prosody and syntax are quite different. Uh, but this, this underlying nature that there are smaller units that combine into larger groups, that combine into larger constituents, is there in both cases. All right, uh, so we can agree that in musical rhythm and language, there's some sort of a similar structure, but that doesn't mean that we actually process the two similarly, right? It could be just coincidence. Uh, short answer is yes and no, uh, but one, one cognitive process, one process, well, more like neural process that I would like to point out uh, that has been reported in both language and rhythm processing is entrainment, which is the process I, by which two or more oscillators become synchronized in frequency phase of both. Now, let's imagine that one of these oscillators uh, is, a, is a population of neurons in your brain that oscillate at a given, well, a relatively flexible, but still given frequency band. Uh, it's been found that, that different neural populations oscillating at different frequency bands can entrain to different periodic or, or even just quasi-periodic oscillations in the acoustic signal. Uh, music would usually feature a more, uh, well, a, a stricter, more isochronic periodicity, whereas language is not, well, speech rhythm is not exactly periodic, but there is still a, a relative frequency at which phonemes, syllables, or higher, higher level, um, constituents of, for instance, the prosodic hierarchy are uttered. And these, for instance, uh, faster gamma oscillations are very, uh, have been shown to be able to enter into phonemes uh, and, and have recently been shown to be causally related to phonemic perception, uh, whereas, whereas, for instance, whereas slower theta oscillations can enter into syllables and so on and so forth. Uh, now, you could say that this is cool by itself, but what is really cool is the finding that these oscillations are there in your brain, even if the given acoustic frequency is not there physically in the acoustic signal. So in this study by Ding and colleagues, uh, they've created, uh, I'm sorry, they've created artificial stimuli from which they removed every ounce of prosody. Uh, I will try to um, well improvise the English version. I'm very sorry, but I will not be able to read the Mandarin. And the English version would sound a bit like dry for a rub skin, new plans, gate for hope, and so on and so forth. The idea behind these stimuli uh, is that you have a very, very strict isochronic periodicity. All of this is built on uh, an isochronic structure in which one syllable, which is also one word, every word is monosyllabic, takes exactly 250 milliseconds. One phrase, which is always two words, takes exactly 500. And one sentence, which is always two phrases, takes exactly one second. If you see, uh, if you look at figure, well, figure B, well, part B of the figure, you can see that what's actually there in the acoustic stimulus is only the four hertz frequency, which is the the rep, which is the syllable level frequency. Sentence boundaries and phrase boundaries are not marked acoustically. Now, despite that, let's look at what your brain does. Your brain in part C of the figure uh, features neural oscillations at one hertz, corresponding to sentences, two hertz, corresponding to phrases, neither of which is physically present in the acoustic stimulus, and at four hertz, corresponding to syllables, which, are, which, is, which is a frequency that's actually present in the acoustic stimulus. Ding and colleagues have taken, this taken this, these findings as evidence that the brain builds internal structure, even if the, this structure is not acoustically present in the stimulus. Full disclosure, uh, these, these findings have been recently criticized, showing, well, arguing that this may not necessarily reflect syntactic structure building, but perhaps uh, implicit prosodic structure building. Notice that prosody was also removed from, from the materials, and notice that we are working with, an, in our hypothesis, a very general idea of hierarchical structure, uh, and we do not necessarily distinguish between syntax and prosody. So while whether these oscillations reflect syntactic and prosodic structure buildings, uh, building is an extremely interesting theoretical question from the perspective of our hypothesis, it's not super important. 
what, what's important is that they reflect structure building. Okay, uh, so now we know that there is a similar structure between language and rhythm, and that there are at least some processes that are shared between the processing of language and rhythm, but does this actually translate uh, into the behavioral level? Do we see any relationship between language and rhythm processing? And the short answer is yes, there is quite a bit of evidence in, in both typical and atypical uh, children. Uh, in, in typical children that uh, rhythmic abilities predict performance at various language tasks and, and, in and in atypical children and adults suffering from basal ganglia lesions and idiopathic Parkinson's disease, uh, that there are comorbidities between rhythm and language processing. And even in these populations, uh, ryth rhythmic and linguistic performance at the syntactic and phonological level are usually correlated. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, there's, only, there's only been one paper, perhaps two, uh, that has looked explicitly at whether multilingualism is related to uh, rhythm processing and found actually that multilinguals show enhanced rhythmic sensitivity when compared to monolinguals. This was measured in a rhythm discrimination test. Um, and one last point of empirical evidence is that rhythmic priming improves syntactic processing in a huge number of populations, including typical adults, typical children, children with DLD, children with uh, developmental dyslexia, and it's also able to restore the P600, which could be taken as an index of syntactic processing in Parkinson's disease and basal ganglia lesions. Uh, right, so what the hell is rhythmic priming? Uh, the idea of, of this paradigm is to present either a more regular or a more irregular, or let's call it irregular and irregular rhythm, right before presenting a language task. It's a very short-term stimulation. Uh, so what, what do I mean by regular and irregular? Very briefly, the idea here is that when exposed to a regular rhythm, which we will listen to in a sec, uh, it is much, much easier for your brain to extract its underlying magical structure and, and build the structure in your head. Whereas when exposed to an irregular rhythm, uh, when exposed to what the authors call an irregular rhythm, I'd like to say, you are still able to find some sort of, some kind of regularity and some kind of structure, but it's, it's more difficult. Uh, let's, I mean, let's give these a listen so that you don't have to take my word for it. If we listen to the regular rhythm, it sounds a bit like this. the irregular rhythm sounds a bit like this. Okay, no one said that they didn't hear anything, so I assume that the sound sharing worked. Um, all right, now let's dive into what we're actually doing here in the project, now that, that the idea of rhythmic priming is clear, which is totally not clear because I forgot to mention that again, that what these studies find is that after exposure to a regular rhythm, uh, these populations perform better at different syntactic tasks than following exposure to, exposure to an irregular rhythm. And the way in which we would explain these results is that a regular rhythm activates this structure that's responsible for, uh, this cognitive system that's responsible for hierarchical structure processing more than an irregular rhythm does. Uh, for disclosure, these findings in these papers are usually explained uh, in the framework of dynamic attending, which I'll be happy to talk more about after the talk, but it's not strictly relevant for what we're doing here. Um, all right, uh, so what, what are we trying to achieve with these two experiments? One question that comes up looking at, at the results of rhythmic priming is whether it's uh, mainly a facilitatory or an in inhibitory effect. Uh, as I've mentioned, most of these studies with a few exceptions, contrast a regular and an, and an irregular rhythm and find the difference. So there are two possible explanations, right? Either regular helps or irregular hinders performance. Uh, but usually what's these, these studies interpret their findings in a way that suggests that a regular rhythm helps. There are a few studies that look at baseline, that include the baseline condition and the regular condition and find the difference. But there are no studies 
that include a regular, an irregular, and a baseline condition, which is what we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be using a silent condition as a baseline. Uh, it's also unclear whether rhythmic priming specifically affects structural processing or something general in, in language. Um, so we will be using a semi-artificial Jabberwocky language in a first attempt to try to concentrate on structural processing. We will remove as much annoying lexical semantics as possible as a first step, but I would like to emphasize that this is a first step, so there's still quite a bit of semantics in our materials. There's also, as I've mentioned earlier, very little evidence on the relationship between multilingualism and structural processing in general. Um, so we will aim to include measures of multilingualism in, in our study and see what we find. Uh, and these priming studies are also based on rather size sample sizes, even when uh, the, uh, the population is uh, typical, even, even when it's a typical population and not atypical children or adults. So we will try to study a larger sample. Uh, all right, so what are we actually doing? Uh, obviously, we will have a rhythmic priming experiment followed by a grammaticality judgment task in which you will have sentences that look a bit like this. It looks scary, doesn't it? This is an, an object relative, if, if this doesn't count as a curse word, um, in which uh, you have one verb, which is true for 90% of object relatives, so this is not news, uh, and, and you have two NPs. One of these NPs is the grammatical subject of the verb. The other of these NPs is the object in this sentence, but what matters here is that it's not the grammatical subject of the verb, but it's still an NP. Um, the crucial difference between these two NPs, if you just look at them, is that one of them is in the singular and the other is in the plural. Um, by just looking at them, the more crucial difference is, of course, that one of them is the grammatical subject and the other is not. And, and what a million studies in, in agreement attraction have found uh, is that when the, when the verb actually agrees to, the, to this other NP, to the object in this sentence that we will call a tractor here, and not the subject, this, these sentences are actually much more common than we think. They are there, for instance, they are there in every second scientific paper I read. Um, these, these are the kind of sentences that people don't really notice, but that people produce. This, it, as, as, this generates some sort of illusion of grammaticality, even though, uh, let me remind you that the verb does not agree to the subject. Um, right. Uh, and of course, these are also the kind of sentences that are often accepted as grammatical in uh, comprehension and not just production. Okay, uh, so how are we going to achieve the rhythmic priming itself? We will borrow the most of the paradigm from the literature we will have a mini plot uh, can, that will consist of a 30 second rhythmic prime or, or 30 seconds of silence, followed by six sentences. Uh, we will then take eight of these with the same prime and call them a block. Then what we are going to do is we will have, we will present to each participant a regular block, then a silence block, then, a re, then an ir irregular block. And there you have an experimental list. Now, to make sure that, uh, that, the or that the order of presentation, whether people are exposed to regular first or irregular first, does not influence our results, half of our participants here will hear regular first, and the other half will hear irregular first. Silence will always be in the middle to, so to serve as a kind of buffer zone between the two uh, rhythmic primes. Uh, all right, so this is one task down. We will also use an, a rhythmic task called the warning imperative uh, that was developed, uh, well, that, that's widely used by Teresa Guasti's lab. Uh, the main idea between, uh, behind this anticipation task is that people are exposed to what's essentially a metronome beat uh, that contains uh, standard and deviant terms. Deviants here always come in pairs, as you can see in the reds are the deviants, uh, and the arrival of the first deviant will signal the arrival of the second deviant as they always arrive in pairs. The task of the participant here is, is to click a response key for the second imperative beat, only the second deviant beat. The idea being that if they extract the underlying structure of the metronome, the participant is able to anticipate uh, when the imperative beat comes, when they hear the warning beat, uh, and they will press the button faster. 
as opposed to if, it, if they can't extract the, the structure and it's a pure reaction time class. We will also use another standardized uh, rit musical rhythm and beat discrimination task from the profile of music perception skills. So this is a discrimination task with two parts, rhythm and accent structure. Um, and in terms of multilingualism, we will assess our participants' multilingual profiles using the LEAPQ and LSPQ questionnaires. We have not pre-selected uh, groups of bilinguals for this study. We are instead trying to take multilingualism as, as a continuous variable and develop indices to try to see which of these indices, or if any, uh, are related to, to structural processing. Okay. Um, now, what do we actually predict? Just to go back to our original research questions, we, we predict higher grammaticality judgment accuracy after a regular prime than after an irregular prime. And of course, and when it comes to silence, uh, it will come down to whether the effect is, is primarily facilitatory or penalizing. We will see that when we look at the results compared to the baseline. Um, we will expect uh, to observe a correlation between rhythmic measures and overall grammaticality judgment accuracy as both of these rely on hierarchical structure processing. And we also expect to observe a relationship between one or more of our rhythmic measures and, um, and uh, sorry, or grammaticality judgment accuracy and our indices of multilingualism, again, under the assumption that what we take as multilingualism indices in, and, and as an index of multilingualism is some kind of an index of exposure to different linguistic hierarchical structures. Uh, does this sound clear? Uh, if not, I guess we will know. Uh, anyway, just to show you the results very quickly, I promised that the results will actually be much simpler than, than the introduction and the experiment itself. What we notice here is that if, if you look at the six sentences overall, uh, remember in every mini block, what you see, what you have is six sentences after one prime. If you look at all the six sentences, uh, you see that that performance in the three prime conditions is a bit all over the place. Uh, but if you look at only the first three, they seem to be very behaving very differently from the last three. Uh, this is, of course, evidenced by an interaction between mini block half and prime. Uh, so if we look at the first mini block, if you look at all six sentences, I can confirm that there is absolutely no main effect of prime. Uh, if we look at the first three sentences only, what we observe is that we find the canonical regular is greater than irregular difference. And we also find that performance in the irregular condition is lower than performance in the silence condition, suggesting that this is more of a penalizing effect of the irregular prime than a uh, facilitatory effect of the regular prime. When we look at correlations between our tasks, we find that um, Rhythm discrimination actually correlates with overall grammaticality and judgment accuracy. And we also find a small trend between the, the rhythmic anticipation task and the number of languages spoken by our participants, uh, only counting languages spoken and uh, an oral proficiency of five out of 10. Uh, please note that these participants were tested in Geneva, which is a, quite a multilingual population. Uh, so this, while this threshold might seem a bit um, high to some of you, it, it looked, uh, I mean, it, it seemed to work very well for our population. They were massively multilingual. Um, all right, so just to give you a very brief summary of what I've already told you, we do find the canonical rhythmic priming effect, but only in sentences one to three. What we find is more of a penalizing effect than a facilitatory effect. Why is this? Is it because we're testing typical adults? Is it because we're using Jabberwocky? Uh, is it because our grammaticality judgment task is a bit more regular, saying we only, we only use uh, subject-verb agreement errors than what's usually used in the literature? Or is it because of our choice of the block design where our silence is never in the very initial position of, of the task, so it's never in a, if, if we assume that there is a task habituation effect, it's never at the very bottom of the curve. Um, these are our options, and I will return to each of these in more detail in the discussion, but the aim of experiment two was to make sure that whatever goes on in this data will also go on in a mixed design experiment, which is what's usually used in the literature. 
Uh, and just to reiterate, we find a trend for a girl, uh, we find a correlation between grammatical judgment, accuracy, and prompts, and a trend for a correlation between number of languages and warning and grade. Um, all right, so experiment two is almost identical to experiment one. What's different is the priming procedure. We still take the 30 second primes plus the six sentences, but rather than creating blocks of identical primes, what, what, we, say, what we do is we force our primes to alternate. So we have a regular mini block followed by a silence mini block followed by an irregular mini block eight times, for instance, in all six possible combinations. So this way, if, if order had any sort of influence in our previous experiment, it's eliminated. And this is also the design that is frequently used in the literature. Now let's look at this here. What, what you see in this graph is probably very similar to what you saw in the previous graph in one sense. The one sense being that, again, we find that the effect is restricted to the first three sentences after the prime, and it's not there in the last three sentences following the prime. If we look more closely at this effect, we find that it's not the same as in the block design. We still replicate the canonical regular is higher than irregular difference, but what we see here is a trend for a difference between regular and silence, with no difference between silence and irregular. In terms of correlations, again, we find that rhythmic scales correlate with overall grammaticality judgment accuracy, but this time we do not, and by rhythmic scales I mean rhythm discrimination, apologies, but this time we do not find the, the correlation between anticipation and uh, level of multilingualism. Um, now, I will skip through this very briefly because the summary says exactly what I just said and it's uh, completely redundant. I will get back to this at the discussion, I'm very sorry. Uh, what we also did to take a closer look at, at the correlations that I've reported so far is put, our data, is put data from these two experiments together. Let me remind you that, these, that apart from the mixed design versus block design and the priming task, these two experiments use exactly the same methodology. Uh, so what we're doing here is probably not a huge sin. Uh, what we find is not surprising we find that, again, rhythmic, uh, rhythm discrimination correlates with overall grammaticality judgment accuracy, and that number of languages spoken correlates with uh, performance on the warning imperative in that the more languages participants speak at a high enough level, the faster they are at anticipating the imperative beat in, in the warning imperative. Test. All right, let's, let's take stock of all of this, because I may have taken a lot of time from you already. Uh, to look at what we find for our first research question, we find that rhythmic priming influences grammaticality judgment accuracy, but only in the first three sentences immediately after each prime in both of our experiments. What's different in between the two designs is that in the block design, it's more of a penalizing effect, whereas in the mixed design, we do find the, the canonical regular and irregular effect, and we find a trend that, that would suggest more of a of a facilitatory effect of the regular prime rather than a penalizing effect of the irregular prime. Uh, so one question is, why do we only find an effect in the first three sentences? Uh, and one possible explanation and one possible difference between our study and what's, and what's usually used in the literature is the use of Jabberwocky. In fact, a recent study has shown that neural oscillations to, uh, the synta to syntactic constituents in language uh, which I think I showed you earlier in the introduction, are actually weaker in Jabberwocky than in natural language. So if we assume that rhythmic rhyming works through structure building processes, and if we assume that these structure building processes are reflected by these oscillations, which are weaker in Jabberwocky than in natural language, then it would stand to reason to assume that whatever priming effect, that the priming effect will be stronger in natural language than in Jabberwocky. Uh, another um, less complicated answer could be that, that our grammaticality judgment task is too regular, too easy for our typical adult participants, and there is not enough room to observe a difference across the six sentences. But again, we do have a very solid difference in, in the first three sentences. So I'd be reluctant to say that this is the only cause of what we observe here. Um, in terms of our second and third research questions, we can conclude that grammaticality judgment uh, correlates with rhythm and beat discrimination, but not beat anticipation. And interestingly, multilingualism shows the inverse 
the number of languages spoken correlates with anticipation, but not with discrimination. Uh, I would also like to highlight that, that our discrimination and anticipation measures themselves do not correlate. So we have, we have a very good basis to say that what we measure on these two tasks is actually, are actually two pretty different rhythmic capacities. Uh, and it's very possible that the fact that PROMS, uh, that the rhythm discrimination uh, involves stimuli that, can, that contain explicit hierarchical structures, whereas a warning imperative contains what's mostly a metronome based on which people can build a hierarchical structure, may have influenced our results. But I, I don't have a straightforward explanation as to why chromatic anti-judgment accuracy would correlate with discrimination and multilingualism would correlate with anticipation. So I would be very happy to have your feedback here. Uh, and in general, I would be very happy to have, have your feedback on everything. Uh, please let me know if anything was unclear or, uh, or just sounded weird. And thank you very much for your attention and all your feedback. And thank you very much to all of, all of my supervisors, colleagues, collaborators, and students who have done a brilliant work collecting data and helping me analyze it.